You're listening to Northwoods Church Matters, a podcast of Northwoods Church in Evansville, Indiana. And I'm your host, Matt Higgins. Wait, 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 wait. No, I'm not. This is your friend, lead pastor, Bobby Pell. Matt Higgins is somewhere in Wyoming, I think, maybe Montana, maybe South Dakota, maybe, I don't know, but he's not here. And yes, I'm leading this podcast. I've never done that before, but we're going to have a great time today. I'm with uh, Nick and Melissa Scott, and we're going to have a conversation about missions and all things Nick and Melissa Scott. So welcome. We're really glad you are here. Hey, thanks, Bobby, for having us. Thank you. So how'd y'all meet? Well, we met here in Evansville. We both grew up here in Evansville, actually on Highway 41 at the Dairy Queen near the airport. That's where we met. She was working when we were 16. I got a job there. and Who liked who first? I probably did. I liked her first, and I had to win her over a little bit more. True. I had my own plans of how <laughs> life was going to work out. Yeah. So yeah. I thought I was going to go off to college in Louisville and find a guy there, but he swept me off my feet. Look at you. Look at you. So favorite blizzard? Mm, probably the chocolate extreme is what I would go with. Cotton candy. Cotton candy. I've never had that. The best. That's really yes. interesting. So that's, that's awesome. <laughs> we did actually make a blizzard once. I think we did it together where we put all of the chocolate toppings and chocolate ice cream in this blizzard. It was a little bit of it chocolate was just overkill. Way too much. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason. But, why <laughs> but it was a fun experiment. So we had a lot of fun together. So, how long have y'all been married? We've been married just over eight years, known one another in some kind of relationship. For about 13 years now. That's awesome. Almost half our lives. That's almost half your lives. So be, be careful or you will, people will start doing math. That's and right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> so I know Nick uh, much better than I do Melissa because Nick and I spent some time together in Ecuador. I'm going to ask some questions about how y'all are different. But what's interesting is, is because I've spent some time with Nick, I feel like I know his responses Less so about you, Melissa, but here we go. Concerning how are y'all different, who's more spontaneous, who's more organized? I'm definitely more spontaneous. Yes. I like a plan. I like to know what's going on day to day. If something comes up that's crazy, I can roll with it, but it's not my preference. Yeah, I understand. Um, Very good. Very good. Who's the extrovert? Who's the introvert? Well, Bobby, I think you know the answer. I know the answer. (laughs) Yeah. I am definitely more the introvert in the relationship. Fair? I'm the extrovert. Yes. Yeah, it was fun going down the interstates, highways of Ecuador, and you know, I would be in the front seat talking to Dave Wilson in the back seat. Yes. I would be talking to Alex, and Nick would be just by himself, yes, quiet, <laughs> off to the side, I'm taking in the sights, man. I'm yeah, in Ecuador. Yeah, and, I'm and he was like, having a great time. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, d- yeah. Dave that would be is like, how you he feel enjoys sorry himself. For him. I'm like, no, I don't feel sorry for him. He's like, he's, everything's great in his yeah, world. That's right. <laughs> uh, who's neat? Who's messy? I think we're both relatively neat. Uh, I think we we don't do well whenever there's a mess around. Yeah. So when I first got married, I was the definite messy one. My wife is the neat one. I would say I have become more neat mm. after thirty years of marriage. And, yeah, and she would say she's become more messy ah. after thirty years. Of marriage. <laughs> and so that's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Is there a frugal and then a spender? I'm more of the frugal one, and she's more of the free spirit when it comes to yeah. money. Yeah, yeah, I got that. That would be true. That would be true. Very good. Who's a morning person? Who's a night person? Or is there? So this is a different answer, I think, than what we would have probably said a couple years ago before kids. Yeah. We were both very much night people, and I think that after having Eliana, she has kind of changed us a little bit more. I'm less of a night person, and Melissa's definitely less of a night person. So, but I'm definitely more of a night person, more than she is. Yeah, neither of us are morning people. Lots of coffee every morning. I went to sleep last night. I mean, everything was off at nine. I was asleep by nine fifteen, nine thirty. Wow. I woke up today at five. That's a little more extreme than normal for me, but <laughs> I am a definite morning person. So mm-hmm. I, yeah. I'm normally here at church by six thirty. Oh if I'm not here gosh. at church by six thirty, that's a pretty it's a bad late day. day. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of people, Nick, probably already know this about you guys, but you are IMB missionaries. Yes, that's right. We We were commissioned with the board in March of this year. 
but we're here now and still waiting for borders to open, but we're excited to get to Tokyo, Japan to serve with the rest of our team that's already there. Yeah. And I think that's part of what I wanted people to hear is, is that we are upstairs in a closet in the children's floor of Northwoods. We are not doing this via Zoom. We are in person because the borders are closed Mm -hmm. at, at this point in time. Yeah. And there's not one person, I think, that knows exactly when that's going to reopen. We're all just kind of trying to pay as much attention to the news in Japan. And really the biggest factor right now is the Olympic Games that are getting ready to start in about a week. The Japanese government has a desire for those to go off without a hitch and Mm -hmm. having less people traveling in and out, it's going to help that more than anything, I guess, in their minds. So we're just waiting on the games to ultimately happen. Are y'all going to watch? We are. Yeah. We always watch the Olympics. What's funny is it's probably eight years ago now because we were still living in Louisville is that we had a conversation with one another when we were watching it in 2012. Was it, was it London? That's right. But anyways, we were watching these and we looked at one another, just looked at her and said, wouldn't it be cool if we were able to go to the Olympics in 2020 in Tokyo? I mean, at that point we had no aspirations to like go on the mission field or go to Japan. That was way out of our plans. And so it was just kind of a cool thing to see. Oh, okay. We really didn't even get to go now, but ultimately we'll be there a little past, hopefully. So, so, so was there in your head a, a, a thought plan, thought process about missions before Nick had a plan? Yeah. So for me, I went to Lithuania in 2008 and 2011. And definitely when I returned in 2011, felt just, I don't know how to describe it. Felt like I was a stranger in my own country. Wondered if God was calling me to foreign missions, had a conversation with Nick. Hey, I'm wrestling through these things. I don't know if God's calling me elsewhere. Obviously, that's going to factor into our relationship. You're probably going to have to tag along because, if it's true. <laughs> because Nick <laughs> made true. it very clear that he was not called. But I was just trying to wrestle through all that and ultimately ended up surrendering to, you know, Lord, whatever your plan for my life is, and then just felt a peace and a calm. So I think what happened is that God was preparing me in 2011 to say yes in 2019 when Nick returned with you from Ecuador. And I was thinking about this, Bobby, too, is like kind of that moment for me. When was it that I would say that was the moment that I was like, yes, this is what God is calling for our family to go do. And I was thinking, you know, it was back in Quito, Ecuador, when we were sitting in a Red Robin eating a burger together. I looked over and I said, do you know anything about Japan? And that was just kind of the moment I think where I was okay with thinking, okay, that's what the Lord wants us to do with our lives. It was definitely a transformative time going even towards Ecuador and serving in a place for a week and a half that ultimately the Lord's not calling us to, but just being willing to go even for a short amount of time. It's amazing what the Lord can do in that amount of time to reveal to you his plan and his purpose for the rest of your life. I mean, I can just tell you from me, being a part of that conversation and not knowing what God would ultimately do with that at that moment, I felt a heaviness to that conversation concerning what God may or may, may not do, but may do in your life concerning missions. Hmm. And I walked away from that saying to myself, and I don't mind saying I talked privately to my wife, Amy, at home when we would walk around our little block. Mm-hmm. And just said to her, it just would not surprise me if something happens with this. Mm. That's one of those moments in my life that will always be there Mm. is eating that burger and the conversation that surrounded it. So that was cool. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And it, it was neat how we both are very convicted about our calling, but Nick had more of a direction on the place. Yeah, I didn't especially feel called to anywhere per se, but just where is there a need? Obviously, there's a need everywhere, but. There is a really big need in Japan. And so I was able to get on board pretty quickly once I saw the need with that place. How are y'all currently preparing? Well, right now we have language requirements that are on us. Uh, Since we're here, still in the States, that can only be done in a limited fashion. But we are meeting with people in tutoring sessions and going through textbooks together, spending at least 10 hours a week trying to give attention to the language, more like 15 to 20 hours is what we're averaging right now. So. 
We're just trying to do the best we can to kind of lay that foundation before we get to Japan so that we're not wandering around aimlessly trying to figure out how to say what we need to say to go to the grocery store, go to the medical clinic or whatnot. And we'll have help with our team members there, but just being able to be a little bit more self-sufficient, hitting the ground, that'll be just helpful in terms of just getting to do ministry more quickly. One of the things I was going to ask is just recognizing your personalities are different. How are y'all preparing that is different from each other. Mm. I mean, I assume that you're not doing identical things in order to learn Japanese, in order to just get ready to go to the field. I just know y'all enough to know that y'all are definitely not the same. No, we y'all, y'all <laughs> opposites attract here. That's right. So how has that how has so. that been different? It's been again just a, a work of the Lord and His sovereignty that we are not able to get into Japan, but he has moved some Japanese families into our subdivision where we live. Two doors down, there is a Japanese family who lives there, and the husband works at Toyota. I just walked down there one Saturday with my Japanese textbook and rang the doorbell. I held it out and said, would you please help me? (laughs) Basically, can we be friends? And so... The wife answered the door. I think she was surprised. That's not something that they would typically do in their culture. Just like knock on a neighbor's door and say like, hey, do you want to get together this upcoming week? But at that point, she knew that we plan to go to Japan and that we are learning the language. Obviously, she is learning our language being in our culture. So it has been a really sweet friendship and an even exchange of Japanese and English. She actually invited another one of her friends into our circle. And so there are three of us that meet. Both of their husbands work at Toyota. They both live in our subdivision. One of them has been here longer, so she's a little more advanced in English. But they both have been so helpful in just explaining the ins and outs of their culture and their language. We've talked about so many things, everything from adoption to why is prisoner and husband just one long vowel different? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and I would say that I, I gravitate more towards- You didn't go um, to a neighbor? No, I didn't knock on the door. <laughs> no. But I think this is where we both draw strength from one another because we do resonate with different learning strategies and just kind of the natural thing that we would go towards first. And so, whereas, you know, I'm more towards running towards a book. And, you know, a video that explains and just tries to give me a huge picture of what the language is, how to understand it, how to use it, all of that. She is much more of the social component that you learn a language to talk with people. You don't just learn it because of an academic exercise. And especially going into Japan as missionaries, we're going to be using the language not just because we like it, but because we need it to communicate the gospel. So we, I think we both motivate one another in different ways um, to be learners in more of a holistic way rather than just erring on focusing on one aspect yeah, of using Yeah, it, we've so. got a research aspect and then a relational aspect, yeah, and right. they come together. And I assume you are, help well, you are helping each other. Yeah. We yeah, are, yeah. yeah. Throughout the week, we'll have different times that we sit down and try to converse with one another in Japanese, and it's broken right now, but it's we're doing basic. our best. And so I think that it's encouraging to maybe even look back three months ago and see kind of the progress that we've made in that amount of time and see just kind of the goodness of the Lord and saying, hey, this time isn't wasted. It's actually been really beneficial in yeah. learning the language and building relationships with our neighbors. What, what have you learned about Japanese culture that you're looking forward to? Besides the food? But, uh, well, that could be. Look forward to that. <laughs> definitely I mean, that, the food. Sure. That's good. Yeah. I think the food is definitely a component that we're on board with. But at the same time, I think that one of the things about Japan that's just so, I think, attractive to many people is just the people. The people are so polite and friendly, hospitable, courteous, and that is something that is just really attractive in thinking about living with neighbors that are that way. But at the same time, that kind of goes towards the opposite end of that question, which is maybe what are the more difficult things of Japan? And along with that personality is also just maybe a cultural hypocrisy as well. Relationships may seem a lot deeper in your mind than they actually are in reality. And so I think that's one of the more challenging aspects of gospel ministry in Japan that missionaries have found is 
They think that they're much more far along in their relationship with somebody, just investing time and hours and language and gospel resources and all of these things. But in actuality, they're still being held at kind of arm's length in terms of the relationship. So Japanese people are a lot more hesitant to share the very personal aspects of their lives and be willing to even examine kind of the worldview implications of why they believe what they believe, because many of them don't think in those terms to begin with. We're not going because of Japanese culture, but we're going because of the people. And our God has really challenged and broken our hearts for the people who live in Japan. And so that comes with really exciting things, but also just really challenging things that we're going to be aware of just because of the fact that we're, we're foreigners. I think another exciting thing is just Japan is a really beautiful country in many regards, just in terms of its valuation of nature and uh, respect of just culture and society with one another. And so it's just a beautiful place to live. It wouldn't take very long to get on YouTube and search Japan 4K drone shots or whatnot, and you just see the natural beauty. And you could do that merely anywhere, but it is just kind of a cool place to live in that. But at the same time, such a broken place because less than half of 1% of people in Japan claim to be followers of Christ. And so there's so much need in Japan for the gospel to take root in people's hearts and for it to spread nationally among people that are living there. So, Yeah, I think there is perhaps a surface level aspect to relationships with Japanese people, but I've realized with my neighbors, I don't know, maybe they feel more free, more open to share with me because I am not Japanese. And so there's also an aspect of we might be able to really show the love of Christ in a way that is very different, very compelling. I've been able to share snippets of the Lord with my neighbors, but just to show love in other ways, like dropping a Mother's Day gift off on their front porch or something. And they observe Mother's Day in their culture, but generally they would not celebrate another mother outside of their family. So talking about the way that moms sacrifice for their children and give of themselves of their time and their energy and their give up their preferences, just talking about even basic things like that, I think has caused them to open up to me in a way that maybe they would not open up to other Japanese people. And so I'm hopeful that that will be the case even in country, that as we show the love of Christ and just reach out that they will feel loved and realize there's something different here. Yeah, I I wonder, is there anything that you've, in the process of studying and thinking through Japanese culture, that whole worldview, Mm -hmm. is there anything that you've learned that you've become surprised about that you just didn't know? Yeah. In Japan, there's a valuation of life. There's a valuation of art and creation. One thing in our visit to Japan in 2019, we took a vision trip there to try to explore whether or not that was the place that we believe God was calling us. We had an interaction with a young man. He really was drawn to an outreach event that we were there for because of just the happiness and the joy that was present in the lives of the Japanese believers that we were there partnering with. One thing in Japan, in Tokyo, was just this sense of emptiness. You look in people's eyes and there just seemed to be not a whole lot going on. There was just kind of this glazed over look. I'm just going to work or I'm going home and that's just kind of who I am and what I'm doing. And then when you talked with believers in Japan, there was almost a switch that was flipped. The way that the Spirit energized them or gave them a joy or a happiness or a transcendence above just kind of that cultural malaise that was present in that place. And so that was really a neat observation there. But I think just going back towards the Japanese perspective of life and its valuation of life. Is it low? So it's not low. No, it's actually pretty high because you value things in a, I think, a different way. You thank things for even just bringing you joy and a happiness in that moment. One thing that's common in Japan is you would say, itadakimasu, before you eat anything. You're thanking whoever was preparing this meal, or you're thanking whatever was going into this meal. The farmers that labored so hard to give you this meal, or the animal that died so that you could enjoy this meal. And so, it's just this gratitude that's shown more traditionally, but that might be a bridge to use as a gospel conversation. Oh, sure. You know, yeah, it's right. just saying, 
why do we say this? Why do you feel obligated to give thanks? So there are bridges like that and, and other things in Japan that I think are really prime opportunities to just have good conversations with people. I know that you, first of all, your father's a pastor of a competitive church down the street. That is hilarious <laughs> right there. <laughs> that is hilarious. Alan is a good friend of mine, and he and I had lunch last week. I love him, and I love Oak Hill Baptist Church. Mm. You served on staff there. You and I both having in common being on staff in local churches. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a question about what would you like to see mm. churches do to support missions? Yeah. Uh, I think the most maybe fundamental thing that maybe churches did a while ago, uh, but maybe has fallen out of fashion, is calling out people to consider whether they're being called to missions. Growing up as a kid in a Southern Baptist church, I remember, you know, that being kind of a common thing that was yeah. really appealed for people to consider. It's just like, is God calling you to go to the mission field? And I don't think that's completely fallen off, but I think that there's definitely been a trend towards maybe not asking that question as much as we need to. I agree completely. Um, and l l let me quickly just jump in and say, just a personal confession here. I don't ask it enough. I don't. You know, we have a situation, I think Matt has seen, and we've two of our teenagers are going to Boyce next year. Mm -hmm. Boyce College, it's a college that is at Southern Seminary. Yep, in Louisville, Kentucky. Yep. Praise God for that. Awesome. Uh, Joe Terry, Eli Campbell, shout out to you guys. But I would just say that we should be looking to our students and adults that God may be working in your life to call you whether that be national or international, who knows? And I think that's a big thing, too, is just because you're called to missions doesn't mean you're called to go around the world to another place. That's you right. know, it might just be that God is calling you to maybe move your family to another city and still work your job, but have a different influence and a different social sphere that's there. And he wants to use you in that place. And so, I mean, there's maybe a f more formal call to missions in terms of maybe a vocational sense, but I think everybody has a certain call towards missions that is given to you because of the very virtue of having the Spirit in you, having the Great Commission given to you as by our Savior Jesus Christ. So, I think that would be one thing. And then another is just providing opportunities for people to experience what mission work is like. That's something that it takes a lot of work to do those kinds of things, but I think they're so valuable because I know that that's what the Lord used in my life. He had to take me out of the U.S. to show me, this is what I have for you. Not necessarily here, but this is what I have for you. That is just such a needed reality for so many people's lives. And I think it might just be the key for some people seeing, okay, I am being called. I am being urged by the Lord to maybe consider some things that might need to be changed about my life going back. I don't know, Melissa, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, Nick and I both went to Boyce together for a time. And there was a sermon at one point while we were there. I don't even remember who the speaker was, but he just asked everyone in the room just to consider why do we automatically think, you know, because we're born in America that we just will live our whole lives here. What if we change our thinking to just, Lord, where would you have me to pour out my life for you? And so just the whole concept of the Great Commission is the first word is go. So go to your neighborhood, go to your workplace, definitely go to your family, to your friends, but also, you know, go to the nations, go to all the world. Romans 10, 13 is pretty familiar, I think, to a lot of people. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then it goes on to ask, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And so just an honest prayer to the Lord, just, Lord, where would you send me? Where would you have me to live my life for your glory? You know, are you willing to give up the comforts of this life and the white picket fence mentality in the pursuit of bringing others along with you to worship at the feet of Jesus for all of eternity? And when I think of it that way, it feels like much less of a sacrifice because Eternity is a lot longer than however much longer I have left on this earth. That's really good. Yeah, one, one of the things that I've struggled with when I've worked with church planters is when I meet a church planter who says, you know, I grew up at point X 
and the only place that I will ever plant is within 25 or 50 miles of this location. And my response has been, but God. All of a sudden, what that does is it limits what is God's plan to reach the nations. Mm -hmm. Yes. And now, I, I'm not saying that God doesn't use people where they're raised. Of course he does. Mm -hmm. But he also picks people up and he moves them. And our responsibility is obedience. Right. And that can be to stay, but it can also be to go. And our responsibility is not to choose stay or go. Mm -hmm. Our responsibility is to choose obedience. That's right. So Absolutely. Thank, thanks for that. Yeah. So IMB is using missionaries to have connections to local churches in new ways. Yes. Help me with this. Yeah. So this is kind of a new initiative that the IMB is rolling out uh, kind of a slow way by the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Yeah. Just one quick uh, note for my non-Southern Baptist friends. IMB stands for? International Mission Board. Thank you. There you go. Yeah. Just because we have some people who are going, who's IMB? Yeah, that's right. So, and uh, what's funny is when in our orientation, they were like, you don't know how many acronyms you're signing up for <laughs> when you join the IMB, you know, so, and that's been very true. But at the same time, this new ambassador initiative they've been rolling out is really just, I think, a, has been a needed thing for a very long time for a host of reasons. But the main reason is just to put faces with the support that churches are consistently and generously giving through the co-opter program of the Southern Baptist Convention. So, we have been assigned a few churches out of the 47,000 that are around here in the U.S., and we are doing our best to just follow up with them and just build relationships and connections, not because we're necessarily asking for money because of the generosity of the contributions of faithful SBC churches all around the country. We don't have to do that, and so that's a blessing that we still haven't gotten over. But we're just there to be resources, to be encouragements, to be helpful perspectives maybe on how can your church strive to be more faithful to the mission that God has called us all to participate in, in your area, in your community, but maybe even internationally partnering with us or other missionaries that you might feel called to partner with. So it's been a really exciting thing for us to consider and think about because we've basically handed a portfolio of more or less 20 churches that we hadn't talked with in the past and just trying to be faithful and building connections with them. And it's been a good thing overall. And I'm excited to see kind of how it maybe over the next couple of years transforms relationships between churches and the International Mission Board, because it's churches that send missionaries. The IMB is just a catalyst to put people all around the world, but it's churches that have the responsibility to place people and send people all around the world. So the IMB just helps facilitate that to happen. And so strengthening that relationship and that understanding will only do more to advance the gospel around the world. Yeah, I 100% agree. And one of those churches is us, yeah. that it happens to be a church that you're working with. And That's I would right. just say the fact that we are one of the churches that you're an ambassador of for, on behalf of the IMB, I'm grateful for. When I was first told about this, that first of all, that that's an emphasis, and then secondly, that we're connected with you in that way. I was encouraged by the process first because I did not grow up in a Southern Baptist church. I grew up in an independent Baptist church, and we had missionaries knocking on our doors all the time because they were trying to raise money. Mm -hmm. On a negative light, they were always raising money. Mm -hmm. On a positive light, churches always had missionaries in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so you always understood missions because there was always a missionary there. Now, the reason why they were always there wasn't always positive. You at least had missions in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that Southern Baptists are seeing the importance of putting a face to the IMB through missionaries mm -hmm. to the local church. I believe this is something that could have, should have happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And just am very grateful for that. Yeah. Very grateful. Yeah. And I think that. It's good for both parties, for, yes. for churches and for missionaries, because I think there can be errors on both sides of just maybe writing a check and just kind of contracting out the right. Great Commission in a sense. Right. But also on the missionaries end, especially if you've been supported for so long, just to take for granted maybe the investment that right. churches all around the country are investing in you. And so I think this will only do a lot to help ultimately in our relationship. And so for us with you and, and Northwoods, I mean, we want to be an encouragement. We want to be a resource to your church and to your people. We'd love to talk with you. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation about missionaries, 
Japan, or maybe even your call. Maybe God is calling somebody here in Northwoods to to surrender their life to. And maybe that means serving with the IMB, or maybe it means something different. But we would love to be that for you in, in whatever way you desire for that to be. I appreciate that very much. I think it's important that we see IMB missionaries as our missionaries. Mm. You know, I recognize that you're a missionary of every Southern Baptist church, but it's also important for it to be seen as personal. Mm-hmm. Nick is going to be preaching here on a Sunday near you. He's going to be preaching one of the Sundays for a summer in the Psalms. I want to conclude just by talking just a little bit about that. I've been very encouraged by our series on a summer in the Psalms. I have been encouraged by our attendance and encouraged by the response of what I see God doing and just want to encourage you to each week be connected to the text. Uh, If you'll look at my Facebook page, most all of you are friends in some way or another to my Facebook page, but I'll be communicating to you what passage is going to be preached that Sunday so that you can read it. Our view is the passage matters more than the preacher because God's word is what changes lives. Now, I'm not ignorant when it comes to the fact that, look, everybody likes to hear Joe more than they do Jim Bob. And sometimes we like Jim Bob more than we do Joe. Joe and Jim Bob don't change anything. It's God's word that changes people's lives. And I just want to always encourage you, remember the passage matters more. God's word changes lives. So look at the word of God, be prepared for Sunday worship. We'll see what happens. I really want to thank you guys for being a part of our time today. Thank you, Bob. Um, yes. This has been thank a lot of fun. Thank you for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks for tuning in to the Northwoods Church Matters podcast. If you'd like to find out more about Northwoods Church, you can visit us at our website, www.northwoodschurch.org. Again, that's www.northwoodschurch.org.